Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Stephanie and this is all about my life after gastric bypass surgery. In today's video, I'm going to channel my inner Adam Savage and Jamie Heineman, and I'm gonna bring you bariatric surgery myth busting. I've put together 10 what I would say are probably some of the most common myths that I see revolving around weight loss surgery, either gastric sleeve or gastric bypass. In no particular order, they are equally as annoying, <laughs> but they're the kind of things that are floating around there, especially in social media, that really need to be addressed as being the myths that they are. But first, just very, very quick housekeeping. If you are a returning subscriber, thank you so much for returning and supporting my videos. I love you, boo. We all need somebody in our lives who is just always supportive and kind and loving, and that's you. You know who you are, and I love you so much. If you're not yet a subscriber, I just ask that at the end of this video, if you do like this content and you wanna see more, that you hit the subscribe button and ring the little notification bell so you know when my videos go live. The first myth that I have is one of the biggest ones, and it's that you cannot have any carbonation after your weight loss surgery. No soda, no fizzy water, no carbonated drinks whatsoever. The general reasoning for this that everybody puts out there is that the bubbles are actually going to expand your stomach and the carbonation in any of those things that you drink is actually going to stretch your stomach. So I see tons of things saying you can't have any carbonation because it's going to gas up your stomach and then you're gonna stretch your stomach out and your surgery is gonna be completely useless. There are a lot of reasons why this isn't actually true. First and foremost, that even after surgery, your stomach is designed to stretch and shrink back down and stretch and shrink back down with what you're eating. That is natural. That is something that your stomach will do even if it's smaller because of surgery. The amount of expansion that you're gonna get from carbonated beverages is not going to be enough that it's going to permanently stretch your stomach out. There's just no scientific evidence out there that actually supports this. Now, over time, you will start to notice that your stomach can handle more and that your stomach stretches out. It's not really stretching out beyond the capacity of what you had for surgery as much as healing and time just allows for that to happen because that's what your stomach naturally does. Right after surgery, things are tight and they're healing and you just don't really have that ability, but that comes back over time. So just because you start drinking sparkling water or something and then over time notice that you can eat more does not mean that it's attributed to the carbonation at all. You know, if we're talking about should you be drinking regular soda after surgery? No, regular soda is one of the easiest, fastest ways to, to weight gain. So we should be avoiding that kind of stuff. Now, whether or not you are on or off the diet soda train, I don't care. I don't want to have that conversation. I don't want to start that debate here. The fact of the matter is it's not regular sugar soda. So there is a difference there just in that aspect alone. But if we're talking about the carbonation, no, the carbonation itself is not going to stretch your stomach out. But one of the main reasons why you are asked to probably not drink carbonated beverages after surgery is because it actually might make you feel really sick or might make you feel really bloated. So it has to do with a comfort rather than the fact that your stomach is getting stretched out. For some people, even years after surgery, that gas in your stomach getting trapped feels like pressure, like bloating. It makes people feel really sick sometimes. So it's best to avoid that, especially right after surgery. Myth number two is a little bit along the same lines. It's that you cannot use a straw after surgery because the extra air that you swallow by using a straw will stretch your stomach. There's a pattern here. There is a huge fear when you are cutting out 80% of your stomach, or in the case of the bypass, you're separating out, you know, about 80% of your stomach. When you're going to that kind of length to make such a smaller pouch, then yes, there's a huge worry for people that they're going to stretch that back out and their surgery is not going to be worth it and long-term success is, is gonna be minimal. So I understand why these things pop up, but again, there's just no evidence to support that 
air itself is going to stretch your stomach in any way. When you're drinking out of a cup, just pay attention to how much air you're actually intaking when you take a drink from a cup versus a straw. There's really not a lot of difference there. And in fact, some people, depending on how you drink, can argue that they intake more air if they're drinking out of a cup. If you're worried about the extra air intake, that's not going to stretch your stomach. But again, the extra air could make you feel sick. And some people do have a lot of pain and sick feelings after using a straw. The recommendation is really to maybe not use a straw the first two or three months after surgery, just to make sure that you've healed fully. But if that's something that really helps you get your hydration in and using a straw is really helpful, if you test it out slowly, to see if it bothers you and it doesn't bother you, then there's no reason that you have to avoid a straw long-term after surgery. Number three is that you can't have chewing gum ever again after bariatric surgery. You see this recommendation a lot not to have chewing gum after surgery. And I think the biggest part of that is because right after surgery, if you accidentally swallow gum, you could have a really big problem with that getting stuck in your sutures and stuck in a stomach that is really only meant for liquids right after surgery. So don't swallow your gum. <laughs> if you're worried that you're the kind of person who swallows gum or might accidentally swallow gum, then I would avoid it for, again, the first couple months after surgery until you're fully healed. But you just wanna be careful so that you're not causing an obstruction or some sort of problem right after surgery. Again, you will hear a lot from people that chewing gum causes you to intake extra air, which is going to stretch your stomach. And these are just not supported in any evidence. Uh, there's, there's no scientific facts out there that really support that this extra air intake from any of these activities are going to actually stretch your stomach permanently. Myth number four is that using gas X after surgery is helpful for the gas pains that you might experience for the first couple of weeks. This one really bothers me because I think that there is a huge misconception about what people mean when they say the gas pains are no joke after surgery and the gas pains are real. When people describe the pain that they're having and they're like, why am I having this pain, you know, in my chest and my shoulder and in my upper back? And what is this horrible pain a few days after surgery? And people say, oh, it's gas pain, it's gas pain. And then you see all these recommendations for taking gas X. People just assume that that's correct, I guess. Gas pains after surgery are a real thing, but what they're doing with bariatric surgery and any laparoscopic abdominal surgery is they're pumping your body cavity full of air. Everything is very tightly packed in in your abdomen and in order to have any room to see and manipulate during the surgery, they need to expand your stomach by pumping air into you. So what you're feeling after surgery that Sometimes, like for me, I could feel it rising up. I could feel the aches in my body going from, you know, more of like my abdomen area where I had surgery to like up in my shoulders and my, my upper back and it felt achy and uncomfortable. That's the gas rising in your body because it's internally in your cavity. Gas X helps for gastrointestinal digestive gas. If you're bloated, it's a totally different kind of gas that we're talking about. So if people are finding relief by taking gas X after surgery, it's either that they're also bloated and you know having some gastrointestinal discomfort after surgery, or it's more of a placebo effect. The walking around and staying mobile and fluid, that's what gets those things out of your system. And I think people are attributing taking a bunch of gas eggs and walking around as it being the gas X that helped them. But really it's just the movement and you have to get that gas out of your system. It has to work its way out after, you know, about a week or so. If you wanna to try to take gas X after surgery, I mean, go for it. Some people seem to think that it helps. I really honestly think it's a placebo effect because it's not the kind of gas we're talking about. <laughs> Number five is my personal favorite myth, and it's that your body can only absorb 25 grams of protein at a time. You will see this repeated multiple, 
multiple times. Especially when somebody posts a picture or talks about drinking some of the protein shakes and things out there that have more than 25 or 30 grams of protein in them. There are some, I think, muscle milk brands and a few things that can have, you know, 45 or 50 grams of protein. Some people say that they add protein powder to their Premier Protein shakes so that they are getting an extra 20 grams in addition to the 30 in the shake. And you'll see this repeated over and over that your body can't process it so you're absolutely wasting your time and your money. I am here to tell you that's not true. It's it's not true. I am so tired of seeing this one. One, what does at a time mean? When somebody says your body can only process 25 grams of protein at a time, what does that mean? Is that per hour? Is that every few hours? It's never said because nobody knows because they keep repeating the same myth over and over. So where did this start? This started with bodybuilders and it started with people who are focused on building muscle. So bodybuilders are very focused on protein heavy diets because it helps build muscle. And it turns out that the optimal range for building muscle, for, for muscle synthesis, is about 20 to 25 grams of protein at a time. Your body cannot attribute more than about 25 grams of protein towards muscle synthesis alone. So if that's what the focus is and you're like, I'm just going to pound 50 grams of protein for breakfast and build massive muscle, it's not going to happen because your body will only use about 25 grams of that for muscle synthesis. But the extra protein is not wasted. If you remember anything from high school science class, it's that protein and amino acids are the building blocks of life. And protein is used to build all the things in our system. Enzymes, immune factors, hormones. I mean, there's so many things that protein helps build in our body. Our body uses protein for a lot of different things. So don't let negative Nancy on Facebook tell you to put down your 40 grams of protein muscle milk because it's a waste of your time and energy, because it's absolutely not. Extra protein can and will be used by your body. It's not gonna go to waste. That being said, spreading out your protein intake throughout the day is going to be best for absorption. And since we are trying to absorb as much protein as we can after surgery, spreading it out throughout the day is probably your best bet, but it doesn't mean that it's gonna go to waste. Number six is that hair loss can be prevented or stopped by using special shampoos or special supplements or collagen powders or all sorts of different things. One of the biggest worries that I see about people who are going forward with surgery is the potential for hair loss. And so many people are worried, what can I do to prevent the hair loss? What can I do after it's started? And how do I, how do I stop it or slow it down? There are a lot of worries about the hair loss. And unfortunately, there's really not a lot that can be done about it. The process is called telogen effluvium. It's the same thing that happens for some people who lose hair after pregnancy or through menopause or even just some sort of traumatic medical event or, or any sort of traumatic event for your body can trigger this to happen. I'm going to have a whole video coming out soon about hair loss and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail, but really the whole thing boiled down is that your body goes through stress and it's going to stop prioritizing things like hair growth. Making sure that you're eating enough protein can go a long way because protein is essential in our bodies for hair growth. And so if you are not intaking enough protein, that could be contributing to your hair loss, but it doesn't mean that if you are eating a bunch of protein that you're doing something wrong. There's a lot of this has to do with our genetics. How much hair you lose, if you lose any at all, is really just down to how your body is going to react to this process. Taking a million milligrams of biotin 
or mixing a bunch of collagen powders into your, your protein shake in the morning or using all those special shampoos that people try to sell you for, for hair loss or for specifically, you know, weight loss surgery hair loss. Any of those things might help you with new growth. The first thing people will do is try to recommend taking a bunch of biotin. Biotin is great. It's super great but it will not prevent you from losing hair. What it will do is it will help your hair growing in, your new growth be nice and strong and healthy. But until your body gets over the shock of what's happening and the massive quick weight loss that's happening, you're going to probably end up dealing with a little bit of hair loss. And the good news is that for most people, it lasts only about three to six months. And for almost everybody, it is temporary. Number seven, is that all those special firming creams out there can help you with your loose skin. Just like the hair loss issue, we're talking about a mostly genetic, personal body reaction to weight loss. Some of us are going to have way more loose skin than others. Most of us are gonna have a little bit more loose skin than just a little tiny bit in the face or on the thighs. Some of the biggest factors for how much loose skin you're gonna have has to do with how long your skin was stretched. We're kind of like balloons, right? So if you take a brand new balloon and you blow it up and then you let the air out, it's never gonna quite look the same as before. But for some people, it might stretch back really quickly. If you're really young or you just have, you know, really healthy skin with a lot of collagen, maybe you'll bounce back really quickly. But if you're older or maybe if you've been heavy like me your entire life, your skin has been stretched for so long that it is completely unrealistic to expect that it's gonna go back and not be a problem. But painstakingly rubbing my body down with firming cream every night is not gonna dent that. <laughs> no firming cream is gonna help what I have here. It's just not. You know, maybe some of the collagen supplements can help, you know, build a little bit of that in your system and keep your skin healthy. And another great way of keeping your skin healthy and more likely to bounce back is staying hydrated. But again, we're talking about a genetic issue. We're talking about something where it's not the same between two people. There's nothing you can really do to prevent it. And there's certainly nothing that you can do outside of surgery to actually physically remove that skin to get the look that most people are looking for. Number eight is that you can't have coffee after surgery. I see this one a lot. A lot of people are also worried about this one because a lot of us are big coffee drinkers and we're super scared over the fact that we're gonna be asked to never have coffee ever again after surgery. The biggest reasoning that I see online for not having coffee after surgery is that caffeinated drinks dehydrate you and therefore anytime you're having something caffeinated you're working against your efforts to stay hydrated throughout the day which is extremely important after surgery but you know the fact of the matter is is that there's really no scientific evidence out there supporting the fact that a glass of coffee is going to dehydrate you if you live off of coffee then perhaps you are working against your own hydration by intaking massive amounts of caffeine. But most of the studies that I was reading support the fact that any diuretic property that caffeine has is so minimal that you're not actually running into any issues. And in some studies, they were actually showing that coffee and tea were just as hydrating as water was. I was always told to count tea and coffee towards my hydration because I mean, coffee is what? Just bean water, right? I mean, <laughs> now I don't count a protein shake or something like that. And I certainly wouldn't count something like soda as being part of your hydration. But there's just no evidence to support that drinking caffeinated beverages, especially like a glass or two of coffee in the morning, is actually dehydrating you to the point where you need to make up with extra water throughout the day. The biggest worry about drinking coffee after surgery is actually the acidity in the coffee. So with the gastric sleeve, there is a higher percentage of people who run into acid reflux issues after surgery and coffee can be a huge contributor to that. So if you are running into extra acid, acid reflux, heartburn issues, you might want to consider, you know, whether or not you're drinking a lot of coffee, the acidity can be problematic. Also, if
if we're talking about right after surgery, you probably don't want to have too much acidity in your stomach while you're healing. And just pay attention to how those things make you feel. Most of this really boils down to how does that make you feel? Does it personally upset your stomach? If coffee is leading to acid reflux issues, then maybe you should cut back or try to not have coffee after surgery. But for me, I have a coffee with my protein shake in it every morning. And so far, I've been okay. Number nine is also one of my favorite ones, and it's that you have to work out in order to lose weight. There are so many people who are anxious to get back to the gym after surgery. And if you're one of those people who likes to go to the gym and it makes you feel good and it just gives you strength and endorphin rushes and, and it just makes you feel good to work out, as it does for a lot of us, then that's absolutely great no problems. But if you're the kind of person who thinks that you just had surgery and now you're itching to get to the gym or start working out because you want to make this as effective as possible, that's just not really as necessary as people make it seem. Weight loss is about 80% in the kitchen and 20% in exercise. Most of your weight loss is going to come from how you're eating. Are you eating healthy? Are you eating balanced? Are you eating too much? Are you eating enough? People have boiled things down to make it seem as if working out really hard every day is going to be the way you see results. And that's just not true. Is it healthy? An essential and part of this process, yes, we should all be exercising. Yes, that is something that we should be doing. Should I have done more exercising? Yeah, probably. But I've lost over 160 pounds since surgery and I barely work out. <laughs> I barely exercise and in all honesty, once the summer was over, I kind of stopped going on my regular walks in the morning too. Do as I say, not as I do. The point is, is that the weight loss is not coming from vigorous working out. That's not what the focus should be. The focus should be on your nutrition and the focus should be on your food, not on whether or not you're busting your butt at the gym. And number 10 is that you can spot reduce fat. There are so many things out there that say if you have stubborn belly fat, then here's an exercise for you. Or I've seen so many complaints about how somebody wants specifically to lose weight from a specific body part. Their thighs are too big. Their arms are too big. What exercises can they do to make those body parts smaller? And unfortunately, nothing. There's nothing you can do. You cannot spot reduce fat. Your body is going to lose fat from wherever it wants to lose fat. And unfortunately for a lot of women, that's going to be in your breasts first. <laughs> Most of the time it's going to be out of the places that you don't want it to leave yet. <laughs> you're going to lose your butt and you're going to lose your boobs. <laughs> but you have no control over where your body decides to lose fat. Some people lose it evenly all throughout their bodies. Some people will lose you know, one particular area first and then they feel like, oh my gosh, my proportions look totally different and, and they wanna know what they can do to even that out. And unfortunately you just can't. Now you can tone your body and doing certain workouts and things can work certain muscle groups and you can change the shape of your body to an extent. So toning your body is very different though than fat reduction. So you cannot choose what areas are going to lose more fat, but you can shape certain areas and you can do some exercises that will change the way those look. So if you are upset with the way that your arms are looking, maybe doing some extra arm exercises and doing some toning in your arms can change that shape to be something a little bit more pleasant as you're going through your process. But anybody that tells you to do a certain exercise to lose stubborn belly fat or stubborn back fat, they're full of crap. Sorry. <laughs> so thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was helpful. These are just the 10 most common myths that I see. If you have one that you see all the time, or if you have something that you're not sure is a myth, drop it in the comments. Let's talk about it. And let's try to figure out if these things that are being spread around are fact or fiction, because I think it really is helpful to not 
spread around misinformation and to know what is scientifically proven and what isn't. And that's the whole point of my channel. I try to do the research and I try to understand the, the rationale and the science behind all of this stuff because it makes a difference. And just because you believe it to be true does not make it true. And it doesn't mean that you should tell people that it's true either. So let's take a moment. We'll do the research, we'll check our sources, and we'll stop the misinformation from spreading any further. So stay happy and healthy, you guys. Always make sure to look at the big picture, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.